Welcome, everybody, to this webinar organized by Scientist Rebellion. I'm Fabian, and I will be your host for today. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, Scientist Rebellion is an international group or, or movement of um, scientists and academics engaging in, among other things, civil disobedience to press for urgent action on the climate and ecological crisis. We're, in, we're active in over 30 countries all over the world, and every so often we, we come together to engage in internationally coordinated actions. Uh, and the next big set of actions is in May, May 7th to the 13th. And if you want to get involved and be part of this, um, I highly recommend joining Scientist Rebellion and in particular uh, your local group. And the relevant information will be shared uh, in the chat throughout this uh, webinar. Now, to today's event, uh, we're very excited to have uh, Professor Kevin Anderson uh, as a speaker. Kevin is Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester, Uppsala and Bergen and was the director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research in the UK. He engages widely with governments, industry, civil society, and is active in research with, with really classic publications such as uh, The Trouble with Negative Emissions and Three Decades of Climate Mitigation, Why Haven't We Bent the Global Emissions Curve, to just name two excellent ones. And together with Dan Calverly, he runs the website Climate Uncensored, which provides a robust, unflinching commentary and assessment of the climate change a, a, a challenge and our responses to it. Uh, Kevin continues to be an extremely sharp and unwavering critic of the status quo and IPCC mitigation modeling. And we're really delighted to have him uh, here with us today. In terms of the overview, I think Kevin will talk for maybe 30, 35 minutes after which there will be a Q&A. So please feel free to, to um, ask your questions in the Q&A uh, chat box. And afterwards we'll call on you uh, to ask the question. Um, note that this will be recorded, so if you don't want to have your face visible, uh, just turn off your um, video when you ask a question. So without further ado, Kevin, uh, please uh, take it away. Thanks very much. Let me just check this works, so try and share the screen. And it is now, what can you see there, Fabian? Can you see the... Sorry. Nice presentation mode, but if you click on full screen, let's see. Yes. So you seen, is that right? You've seen full screen there. Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Let's just see if that's working. Yeah, it is great. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I've called this talk here um, a velvet or a violent climate revolution, and which will we choose? And this is this is a sort of culmination of a lot of work with lots of colleagues, but particularly uh, with my immediate colleague Dan Calvary in the UK and Isaac Stoddard in um, Sweden, but also other colleagues, um, Jesse and so forth in, in Norway and other colleagues at Tyndall Center in, in Manchester. So um, I'm gonna start off with a little health warning, which is probably less necessary for this particular group, but sometimes when I speak, it is. Um, this is very much a, a red pill presentation for those people that, that are familiar with the matrix. Um, I don't like my conclusions, but they are my conclusions. They're not overplayed or underplayed. My language sometimes may appear a little, prov little provocative, but I would argue that it accurately reflects the analysis and that it's really only uncomfortable within the sort of cozy climate tales and, and storylines that we've, that we've come to normalize. So um, it's very much a, a direct interpretation of the work uh, that I and colleagues have, have undertaken. I'm going to ask to start off with, well, ask really what, you know, what is our key climate concern? And I think it's important to remind ourselves that we're not really interested in temperature. We're not, you know, what 1.5, 2 or 4 or whatever. What we're really interested in is the, the rate of change of impacts. That's what's really key. And then the question we ask ourselves is, can we, human systems, adequately adapt to such rates of change? And what are the implications for wider ecosystems and, and hence us? Um, temperature, and we, I think it's important to remind ourselves of this. It's very obvious, but really temperature is just a proxy for rates of change of impacts. And I think we have to you know, keep that in the forefront of our mind here, really. Um, but I also think we have to focus on this we. And I will come back to this, this who is this we throughout the presentation. It's often ignored. Um, you know, who is the we that makes the various choices that we, that we make? So let's start off now by thinking about what have we committed to. And again, it's the we in this to some degree. So going right the way back to 1992, um, which people of my age can, can re easily remember, we had the, the big uh, Rio event and the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, was established. And within that um, very important document that pretty much all countries of the world signed up to, we agreed as the sort of a, the fundamental objective of that convention was to um, prevent anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That was our key goal. 
anthropogenic interference with the climate system. It also in introduced in Article 3 a really important concept of international equity um, under the, sort of the, the, the title of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And that very much that means that developed countries, um, as they're called in the Paris Agreement and indeed most negotiations, should lead in combating climate change. That's another really important part um, of the UNFCCC. I think it's important to remember that when we're thinking about, about um, defining what's dangerous, that science is very much our servant, it's not our master. Science can't tell us what is or is not dangerous. It can inform the debate, but ultimately the decision as to what is or is not dangerous is a, is a political one with a, with a small p. And this again comes down very much to who is the we that's making that decision. So the we there again is, is very important. So move on um, you know, really a couple of decades and um, what we had was the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we started to sort of try to quantify anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And the Paris Agreement, as we're all familiar with, was the, the idea of trying to stay well below two degrees centigrade of warming, and ideally just 1.5 degrees, to do that in accordance with the best science, and very much on the basis of equity, this concept of common but differentiated responsibility. But no country has taken that seriously, no rich country has taken that seriously, either before Paris or indeed since Paris. But since we've had the Paris Agreement, there's been these a special report on 1.5 from the IPCC and then the latest report, assessment report six from the IPCC. And I think what's really important about those is that they've significantly upgraded the impacts occurring at, at 1.5 and indeed lower temperatures. And I've, I say this as the IPCC quite rightly is a, is a, you know, is a, is a scientific consensus and, and therefore it is a conservative process. And that, that is inevitable. It's not a problem, but it's important that, that a user of the IPCC, a discerning user of the IPCC, is aware that it's, a, that it's an innately conservative process. So it excludes, for instance, quite a lot of the Earth system feedbacks, the ESFs as we call them here. So quite a lot of the Earth system feedbacks are not embedded within the carbon budgets or the, or the main analysis from the IPCC. It also has a, there's a risk there that the airborne fraction could increase. In other words, half the emissions we put out at the moment is, are absorbed by the oceans and the land. And the assumption is that that half will carry on, that service that, that, that the globe is providing for us will carry on unchecked. Well, as a lot of people suggest, that may not be the case as the um, concentration goes up in the atmosphere of greenhouse gases. And it also doesn't embed um, the broader concern around um, planetary boundaries and tipping points, tipping elements and so forth. So all these factors aren't in what is rightly a quite conservative IPCC, but it's in incumbent on us as users to be aware of that. Also, since the... Um, Paris Agreement, we've amassed a huge level of uh, information on the impacts that have already occurred at below 1.2 degrees centigrade of warming and below. So there's a whole lot of information there. So I think it's hard to argue in 2023, hard to argue against 1.5 really being the maximum that we can that we can associate with prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And that's a different matter as to whether we can achieve it. But I think 1.5, I think it's been very clearly demonstrated that that is the maximum threshold really that we should be aiming for. And that was, of course, um, at the Glasgow COP. As you can see here, this is Patrick Valance, the government's chief scientist, saying 1.5 uh, needs to be kept alive. It's not a negotiable thing. And so there's a, there's a strong pressure behind 1.5 from, from, from the wider expert community and indeed beyond that politically. Here's the, the UK government. Um, if you take it at face, at face value via the Glasgow Climate Pact, expressing alarm and utmost concern that human activities have caused about 1.1 degrees centigrade of global warming and the impacts already being felt in every region. You would have think if it would acknowledge that, then presumably it would act accordingly, but that's so far not been the case. So what does the latest science tell us about the timeline? And that's a really important part of all of this is the timeline for thinking about 1.5 to, to 2 degrees centigrade mitigation. Well, let's, this, this slide looks flippant and I've been using it for a while, but I think it's it's, it's well meant, and I actually don't think it is flippant. The climate does not respond to good intentions, to Machiavellian policies, to eloquent arguments, legal niceties, promises of tech tomorrow, or accountancy scams. And in that, I include net zero. Um, all of these are trumped by the brutal beauty of the physics. And I say, I put these things up there because this is what we've tried for 30 years, and it's failed. So it's about time we move beyond this to actually start to put things in place that actually responded to the physics. And the physics is fairly clear. If you look here across the recent um, um, IPCC reports from AR5 through to today, what really matters in terms of temperature is the total amount of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere, the carbon budget. 
long-term targets, 20, 2050 net zero or 2070 or 2045, all of these are um, have very little to do with temperature and actually are much more to do with delaying action today than they are to do with um, responding to the climate challenges. If we look at the latest report from assessment report six, what you get is a series of tables like this that give us a clear indication from the best science that we have as to what the budgets look like. So if you want to stay within 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming or indeed of two, um, these budget values are from 2020, uh, then you have these different amounts of carbon dioxide you can put in the atmosphere for different probabilities of these temperatures. Now, we're not in 2020. I think it's really important to remind ourselves that every year we're putting out over 40 billion tonnes of CO2, 40 billion tonnes. So if you update the latest IPCC budgets to the start of this year, and of course we're already quite a long way through this year, then for a 50-50 chance of 1.5 or an 83% chance of staying below 2, so this is well below 2 or pursue 1.5 in, in the way that we interpret it, then we get these budgets of roughly roughly 400 to 800 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's about 9 to 19 years of current emissions, 9 to 19 years globally. That's also, if you were to start reducing today, that's a global reduction rate of, of 11% for 1.5 and 5% for 2 degrees centigrade every single year, year on year, starting at the beginning of this year. And we're using the budget up at the moment for 1.5 degrees centigrade at about just under 1% every single month. So this year, we've already used up about 3% of the budget for 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we're using up a little under half a percent every, every, um, every month for two degrees centigrade. I think it's also worth remembering here, and I've, I put this slide up because a lot of people keep saying that you know 1.5 is dead. And I think that's, I think that's deliberately, well, it's either mis deliberately misleading or misunderstanding what the science tells us. A good chance of staying below two degrees centigrade, an 83% chance following the IPCC carbon budgets, uh, uh, probabilities, is the same carbon budget as an outside chance, a 17% chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And I still think even though a one in six chance is not a great chance, we'd take it if it was, if it was something else, a medical condition, we would take the treatment probably for a one in six chance of recovery. So, you know, let's not pretend that 1.5 is out the window. It's the, 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 there's every reason to be pessimistic, but nevertheless, if we do pull out all stops to reduce our emissions, there is still an outside chance of holding to 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming. If we look at these budgets graphically, they tell us quite a lot about the scale of the reductions. Now, this is just taking the, the straightforward exponential reduction of 11% and 5%, and you, you can see incredibly rapid starting immediately. If you were to draw straight lines, these are just stylistics, just to draw straight lines from, from where we are today, then... For 1.5, you have to be zero emissions by 2040 and 2060. For two degrees centigrade, that's if you came down straight away on those 1.5 lines. But if you say there's any delay, and of course there is inevitably going to be some delay from political and technical inertia, even if we were genuinely committed to deliver on 1.5 uh, degree centigrade, then these are the curves that you would see. And the reductions are incredibly rapid and, and, and very early. Now, I would argue that the blue line from work that Dan and I and other colleagues have done we can't see how you could stay within the blue line, which is a 50-50 chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. But we do think we can stay within the red line, which um, uh, you know, we would actually recommend that, that that be pulled towards the blue. That's what we should be aiming to do, to make that red line much nearer the blue line. Um, but that's the carbon budget we, we, that we're playing with. Now, those are global plots of emissions. And of course, at Paris, and indeed every international negotiation, we've signed up to reduce our emissions on the basis of equity. And so following the language of the Paris Agreement, and indeed going right back to the UNFCCC in 1992, there's this language of developing country parties and developed country parties. And it's not a language that we're particularly warm to, but it's the language that's used. So I'm gonna use that um, throughout this presentation. And you've got to divide that carbon budget between those two on the basis of this, this concept of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. In other words, the equity part that says that developed countries should lead in reducing our emissions. So if you play out those carbon budgets globally for a 50-50 chance of 1.5, you end up with something like this. Now, the, the blue line here is for developed countries and the orange line for developing countries. And you see that the, you know, very approximately, the developed countries need to be zero emissions by the early 2030s, 2031, that sort of, I mean, give or take a year or two, that sort of time frame. Um, 
Now, that, in some ways, that looks unfair because it looks like we're giving developing countries a little bit longer. But of course, we've got the historical legacy of emissions that, that we've put out. But actually, even ignoring these historical emissions, the, you know, the, it's worth bearing in mind that less than 20%, 18%, I think, of the world's population live under the blue curve and 82% live under the orange curve. So even under these curves, it's actually still more onerous per capita, if you like, for the wealthy, for the poorer countries than it is for the wealthier countries. So this still isn't really a fair um, division, but we would argue it's, it's, it's the only one we can really get for 1.5. But when it comes to two degrees centigrade, and these, these curves here are very provisional. Dan and I, we work in these at the moment because um, they're, they're based on some slightly old data. Um, then we have a little bit longer. So to the mid 2030s, maybe a little bit longer than that for the wealthy parts of the world and out to the sort of 2050s, late 2050s for the poorer parts of the world for two degrees centigrade. Now, it's reasonable to ask, can we draw different mitigation curves? Well, as I said before, I think for the 1.5, 50% chance of 1.5, we're pretty much locked into those reduction curves. There's really nothing we can do about that now because the budget is so incredibly small. Remember, it's just nine years of current emissions. When you come to the two degree C carbon budget, which is roughly twice as big as the one for 50% chance of 1.5, there is some flexibility, but not a lot. And I would probably argue that flexibility should be given to the poorer parts of the world who are the ones that are rapidly industrializing or the ones that have yet to industrialize, rather than actually be given in, in addition to the wealthy parts of the world. Now, th this whole narrative is very different from the sort of net zero story that has come to dominate the climate change mitigation sort of agenda for the last few years. So I want to try and unpick this whole concept of net zero a little bit, because I think it's really important and it has been deeply misleading. First, let's be clear that net zero is a new phrase. It's not something we've been using for a long time. If you go back to the assessment report five from the IPCC in 2014, it was used in the summary for policymakers 24 times. And virtually all of that was related to construction, to passive houses and so forth. It wasn't related to how we use it today. If you go to working group three of assessment report six, it's used about a thousand times in the SPM. So, uh, and summary for policymakers. So it's, it's a huge shift in just very few years. And virtually all of its use now is to do with carbon dioxide removal and negative emission technologies, ways that we can suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere um, in decades from now. And in the UK, we've got the Committee on Climate Change, who didn't coin the term, but certainly have popularised this, this net zero framing. In the fifth budget report from the Committee on Climate Change in 2015, it wasn't mentioned once. And yet you look at the sixth carbon budget report. From the IPC from the Committee on Climate Change, and it's between three and five thousand times. You struggle to find a page when it's not being used. And it's been completely normalized this term now. It's used within media, within academia, within almost everyone who talks about climate change says net zero without really understanding what they mean by it. Um, and if you ask them, you often find them sort of fumbling over any sort of meaning for what, what you know what it what they intend to suggest um, in relation to it. Net zero typically assumes some sort of multi-layered substitution. And this is incredibly dangerous, this, because this, uh, this plays into the hands of the bean counters. It allows us to, to compare different greenhouse gases and see them as equivalents. So carbon dioxide for methane. It allows us to see as equivalent different gases from different sources. So carbon dioxide from cars can be compared with um, N2O emissions from agriculture and um, from fertilizer. It allows us to, to compare across timeframes. So the carbon dioxide from a flight today can be compared with the carbon dioxide captured in a tree in 2070. It effectively takes a ton, is a ton, is a ton of greenhouse gases, regardless of different chemistries, different atmospheric lifetimes, and very different levels of certainty and risk. I mean, the, 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 the certainty of if you burn a litre of fuel in your car, you're going to put out some carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. But we can't be certain that CO2 would be captured by a tree we plant today in 2030 or 2040. So it really is very dangerous across all of these methods of substitution. It also net zero embeds, deeply embeds at huge scale, um, negative emission technologies and nature-based solutions as ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, collectively called carbon dioxide removal. And the scale, in, uh, it is without any exception, I think, in the IPCC scenarios for 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. And it's in many, if not most of the scenarios for 2.5 to 3 degrees centigrade of warming. And it's at scales of hundreds of billions of CO2, sometimes like half a trillion tons, if not more, of carbon dioxide, is assumed to be captured by these technologies that do not exist at scale today. 
And most of that capture is after 2050, and some of it's even after 2100. You, know, you ask yourself, when are the policymakers or the, or the, or the scientists proposing this? Will they still be around then? So they're proposing things to resolve climate change significantly when they no longer will be either engaged in the issues um, um, or will be retired or, or pushing up the daisies. And the scale of this assumption is, is huge. It's roughly assuming an industry that does not exist today at the, at, the, at the level equivalent to the current oil and global oil and gas industry. That would be fine if it was in one in every 10 scenarios or um, even 100 in a 1,000 scenarios, but instead it's in virtually every single scenario. So my position on carbon dioxide removal is, yes, we should fund it. I think it's, it's potentially very important. Um, and if it meets stringent sustainability criteria, ecological and social, then let's, let's ap apply it. But let's not assume it works when we're trying to reduce our emissions today. So mitigate emissions today, cut emissions today, assuming CDR will not work at scale. And there's a good reason for that anyway. Even if it does work at scale, we will need it to compensate for some of the agricultural emissions that we cannot eliminate if we're trying to feed 9, 10 billion people around the planet. So even if we all went you know, vegan and had um, low rice, low tilled um, agricultural practices, then we still have some emissions from what my understanding from other colleagues who work in this area. And agricultural emissions, though I'm not focusing on them here, um, are a very important part. Land use emissions are a very important part of the climate change picture. Probably about 20 to 25% of the warming comes from those gases. But this means, because we cannot eliminate the ones from agriculture, that energy needs to be real zero, not net zero, real zero. So no energy emissions, basically no fossil fuel use. Now, one of the arguments for net zero is it's seen to be um, a policy framework for all. And this is a strength that a lot of people say. But to me, this actually undermines the actual call for a rapid phase out of fossil fuels. All these companies here, all these paragons of virtue, all of these companies are planning to, are at the moment looking for more oil and gas um, and are looking to uh, ex, um, develop more, and gas field, more oil and gas fields over the coming decades. Yet they're all signed up to net zero by 2050 or thereabouts. So they've all got net zero targets, yet they're all looking for more oil and gas. And indeed, so is, the, so is the case with all of these countries. All of these countries are signed up to net zero or something approximating to net zero. Um, and yet all of these countries are desperately seeking for more oil and gas, indeed coal in some of these countries as well. And this is in stark contrast to Gutierrez's comment um, uh, just, just recently, that he, where he points out that today, fossil fuel producers and their enablers, and that means, of course, our governments often, are still racing to expand production of fossil fuels, knowing full well that this business model is inconsistent with human survival. Now, we're not, probably not talking about all human survival, but certainly for huge proportions of the, of the gl global population, this ongoing pursuit of fossil fuels looks incredibly dangerous. So I now want to try to sort of turn this around and say, well, what would a response to climate change look like? Um, and I'm not going to put a huge amount of detail on this. It will depend on which country you're in and uh, you know, cultural, geographical and socioeconomic constraints and so forth. But so I, I've seen it as a sort of two phase response to the Paris Agreement. The first one is about the, the 1.5 or even two degrees centigrade demands a technical revolution. But that revolution is mostly in deployment. It's not about exotic tech tomorrow. It's actually about deploying what we have available today. And another way that I framed this, phrase this is borrowing from the sort of language of the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War, when we you know, pretty much destroyed much of Europe, continental Europe anyway, um, was the Marshall Plan. But something even much larger than that, but without the subtle political agenda that went with the Marshall Plan. So we're talking about the rapid deployment of existing zero carbon technologies um, rather than relying on future technologies. Headline examples might be retrofitting our existing homes to make sure that they're much lower energy consumption and much more comfortable for people to live within, that all new properties meet the most stringent passive house designs that are possible. And I would also argue are limited in the size because that makes a big difference in terms of resource use. The rapid rollout of public transport across all socioeconomic groups, EV charging in rural, rural environments, but I think it's not necessarily the right thing to be doing in cities. In fact, I would argue it's not the right thing to be doing in cities. Um, the rapid uh, shift to zero carbon electricity within broader social and ecological criteria, a major program of electrification. Remember, most countries, only about 20% of their energy is electricity at the moment. The other 80% is usually something approximating to direct use of fossil fuels. Um, and deep and rapid reductions in the demand for aviation in particular, but also shipping. And that's primarily because those two sectors are very hard to decarbonize, particularly the former, 
the aviation one. So in the short term, we'll have to reduce, short to medium term, we'll have to significantly reduce demand. There's, there are better prospects for doing something on shipping. Um, in 2023, however, you know, technology, it is certainly a prerequisite for delivering on 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, but we've had 30 years of deliberate failure to address climate change. And so it's now far from sufficient. And as an engineer, I think that's a bit of a shame. I, mean, I like technology, it can do a lot, but it cannot, it cannot deliver on our 1.5 to 2 degrees commitments um, in isolation from other significant shifts um, in our social norms. And it's those things I want to touch about now. But of course, there's a whole agenda against changing our social norms. So this is from Davos this year. These are some of the people that are framing the climate debate. In fact, at this very moment, they're talking about offsetting. You know, can you notice any problems about this group of people um, you know, setting the agenda for climate change? Rich, older, white men in grey suits in Davos talking about climate change, and they're talking about offsetting as a surprise. Um, you know, this, this group are set up to deliberately undermine the social changes that are required if we deliver on the commitments that they and others of us have made. And the reason they don't like it is because actually, when you look at 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade and combine that with the science from the IPCC, you know, a simple equation says that equity is an absolutely key part of the agenda now. And that's one thing that those of us who are high emitters don't like to hear. So we'll look at equity in two ways. Look at it firstly per person. So we're all familiar with these numbers, these, these sorts of plots about different em em emissions per person for different parts of the world. But these are just the means, the averages. And I think we have to be very careful not to be taken in by the means. Um, if we looked at the UK, UK household income, as indeed for most countries, is very closely linked to emissions. And yet look at the, the mean household income in the UK. So the typical sort of average household income is about £37,000 a year. You know, a typical professor in the UK gets paid about £85,000. So straight away, you see the difference between those of us working on climate change, you know, at least senior ones, um, and the average person in the UK. Median household income, take line them all up and take the one out the middle, it's about £31,000. And if you look at them, I think it's in £2,000 groupings, the most common grouping for households is £23,000. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we think about climate change, we, but there's no universal we. Those of us who are, touch, who are sort of framing the agenda typically are in households and with our own individual income, far above the mean in our own country, let alone the median or the mode, and let alone, of course, compared to the poor parts of the world. Carbon dioxide emissions are highly skewed towards the few, and there's plenty of work on this now. There's a recent IEA report on this, just came out in February, a new paper from Lucas Chancel on this, the previous work from C. Van Carter and the Stockholm Environment Institute. So there's a whole wealth of work on, on the inequality of, of emissions. Roughly half of emissions come from just 10% of the population. But I think much more damning than that, the collective, collectively the top 1% have lifestyles that give rise to almost twice the emissions of the bottom half of the world's population. And I think I should sort of stop us in our tracks. That you know, the lifestyles of the top 1% give rise to emissions to almost twice that of the bottom half of all of the world's population. And uh, I think we know who's in that 1%. As a quick thought experiment, this is an old slide, but it's still valid. In fact, I just checked it again recently. Imagine that we, we did think we were in a climate emergency and that then regulations were put in place in each country to stop, to, to require the top 10% of emitters to cut their carbon footprint to the level of the average European um, citizen. And the other 90% make no reductions. That's the top 10% of global emitters down to the level of the average European. The other 90% just carry on business as usual. That's a one third cut in global CO2 emissions. Now, I reckon if it's a climate emergency, you could do that in under a year. Probably if it's an emergency, you could probably do it in two weeks. But of course, when you look at the national determined contributions, the pledges that countries have made, there is no reduction by 2030 globally. So there's a, there's a huge void in the sort of emergency measures between what's, what we could achieve and what our pledges, when you sum them together, are actually pointing towards. But why has equity remained a taboo subject? Why is it it's virtually never talked about? within the integrated assessment models, within the Committee on Climate Change's work in the UK. Well, who sets the agenda? Who builds the mitigation models? Who develops the scenarios? The politicians, the economists, the finances, the CEOs, the professors, the modelers, the journalists, the heads of NGOs and billionaire celebrities. We're the ones that color the mitigation debate. And with few, if any exceptions, we're in the top 1% of emitters. And if we're not, then we're desperately clamoring to join them. So there's a real issue here that 
that those of us who have colored the mitigation debate, we may have done a very honest and good and wonderfully job at some of the climate scientists on the climate science against huge opposition from the oil and gas industry. But when it comes to mitigation, I think we, you know, we've, we've been found uh, we've been found wanting really in terms of sort of honesty and integrity in terms of the scale of the challenges we face. And what we've done is we've colored the agenda that somehow perfect green technologies can be delivered through carbon taxes. And essentially the business as usual status quo can just carry on as it is. But this of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's good for those of us who are in this high emitting group, but it avoids us asking these deeply uncomfortable questions about distribution, fairness and power. And I think there's been some, you know, I think almost to some degree this has been deliberate. But I also think there's another more, uh, more, in, more dangerous agenda going on here is the equity between nations. If you look at the scenarios, I've been quite careful with this here, the scenarios in the IPCC, I just think they treat developing nations with contempt. And I've been careful about choosing that word because it's a very strong word. But as far as I'm aware, all, well, I, I know this bit, all the major, middle, major mitigation modeling groups, the integrated assessment modeling groups are based in wealthy developed nations, principally Europe, the US, and Japan. I think there's one Brazilian model, but I think it's actually based in, the U, uh, based in Europe. I think, again, without any exceptions, the, the IPCC scenarios, which come from these integrated assessment models, maintain the massive inequality that currently exists between developed and developing countries. And worse still, a lot of their scenarios actually see the levels of inequality out in the future rise. There's some really excellent work. I'd definitely recommend uh, following um, some of the, well, either on Twitter, but also some of the actual work from Tejal uh, Kanekia and, um, and Jayaman, another one of her colleagues, and other colleagues, these are, these are two Indian colleagues that have uh, produced some really excellent work looking at the inequalities and the integrated assessment models. And this is the conclusion from one of their recent um, papers. Our results show that the IPCC AR6 scenarios disregard both the historical responsibility of the global north for carbon emissions, as well as the future energy needs of the global south required to meet developmental goals. The burdens of climate change mitigation is placed squarely on less developed countries, whilst developed countries continue to increase their energy consumption. So not only is inequality ignored within our countries, but it's ignored between our countries. And it's actually embedded or even exacerbated in the main integrated assessment modeling um, scenarios. So where does all of this leave us? Well, at first, second and third glass glance, I don't think things are looking particularly good. The impacts of 1.5 look set to be worse than we'd previously imagined. And we're squandering the remaining 1.5 degrees C carbon budget at about 1% every month. In all nations, there's a huge difference in responsi responsibility for emissions between citizens, but the expert group are typically high emitters and have benefited hugely from the sort of deeply inequitable status quo. We've committed um, in every international negotiation on climate change to balance rapid and deep mitigation at the global level with improved well-being for poorer nations. And that means zero fossil fuel use by 2030 to 2040, really nearer 2030 for, for the wealthy countries for 1.5 um, and 2040 to 2050 um, for the poorer countries, again, near 2040 for 1.5. Yet self-serving oil executives and weak national leaders are scrabbling for yet more oil, gas, and coal. So things are not looking particularly good. But set against that, actually, I think, I think that for the majority of people, even in industrialized countries, I'm more focusing on those here because that's the area I know, and I don't want to, I don't want to speak too much about some of the less industrialized parts of the world. Um, but industrialized countries across continental Europe, the US, and so forth, I think responding to climate change there is a real win-win opportunity for the majority. Comfortable and affordable homes. Never could be that, that be more important than we're seeing today with the, with the um, implications of, of Putin's war on energy prices. High quality public transport, secure and valued employment, because you've got to provide these things, which are, you know, are large pieces of infrastructure. Uh, better air quality, which means better, quality, better health for our children, which means better improved education for our children. A functioning infrastructure, improved civil well-being, because it requires that all of this to be put in place to make society a much more sort of thriving place and low carbon. But this requires huge resources and labour to do this. And that means we've got to move those, those resources and labour that currently furnish the private luxury of people like me, towards the well-being of society more generally. So it's not about taking from the rich and giving to the poor, it's about taking from the wealthy of us in society and using that for the public good. So it's to a future of private sufficiency 
and public luxury rather than private luxury and, and many times public squalor. But don't underestimate those opposing this progressive vision. There are huge forces rallied against this and the Davos set more typically, but you know, just include the great and the good, the expert community, the CEOs, you know, the people in the one to 10, maybe even 20% groups in our society. They will be rallied against any sort of progressive agenda because there's a recognition that for that relatively small proportion of the population, it will mean foregoing some material well-being. And we are very reluctant to do that. Um, so yeah, there, there will be lots of people trying to stop this sort of agenda. And this leads me to my final few slides. I think we are now facing in 2023, and I think we've probably been facing this for a while, a distinction between really choosing a velvet revolution or having imposed upon us a violent revolution. I see no way out of revolutionary changes now. From the way the science, what the white science tells us from the empirical evidence we're seeing from impacts, how rapidly temperatures are going up and how rapidly concentrations of the CO2 and other greenhouse gases are rising. I think you know there's no way out of the revolutionary changes from where we live today. And I think it's too late for, for, for non-radical futures. So I see the choice in a simple binary fashion here. So it would be obviously more nuanced this in reality. The choice is between rapid, deep, fair, and organized decarbonization of modern society. Um, I would call that the velvet revolution, borrowing from the uh, um, from the separation of the break uh, or, um, uh, 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 of, of the Czech Republic or uh, of Czechoslovakia into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. That was much more one that was. Of significant changes, but without without violence, that sort of evoking that sense of a velvet re revolution. Or we carry on as we are today with ongoing lies, rhetoric, delusion, and delay as temperatures just continue to rise and become dangerous for all. And that will ultimately end up in a violent revolution. And that probably is already playing out in some parts of the world today, exacerbating existing tensions. So I see we're really they're the choices that we have. Um, so to conclude, the headline choices for developed countries, as I see it, is that we can ignore international equity. We can pass a huge burden onto our children and be part of a two and a half to three degree C future. We can renege on our Paris and Glasgow and our UNFCCC commitments. But that aligns nicely with today's politics. It dovetails with the market economics and so forth. And it fits nicely with some of the IAM mitigation scenarios and the Committee on Climate Change and so forth. It's, it's about 5% per annum mitigation net zero by 2050 and that sort of thing. But I mean, I think anyone who's aware of these numbers nowadays knows that that has very little to do with climate change. If we are serious, however, about climate change and we want to take our international obligations seriously, then that means a huge mitigation effort by this generation to cut CO2 in line with 1.5 and abide by our Paris and Glasgow commitments. That will mean a huge ramp up in government leadership, a reshaping of mainstream economics, with equity at its core. And you look at the reduction rates there, you're talking about things that 15, 20% or more per annum um, and real zero from fossil fuels by 2030 to 2035 and big changes in agricultural practices and indeed in wider land use as well. The IPCC actually, um, in working group two, I think they capture the scale of this challenge. So I'm just gonna use a quote from them. Targeting a climate resilient, sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to underlying values, worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems, and power relationships. And I couldn't say it better, and that comes from the IPCC. I see us really now in the 21st century. We're looking for some sort of Rooseveltian leadership. And I definitely recommend look, um, listening to, they're, they're available, on, um, you, you can actually listen to them or you can read them, the fireside chats from Roosevelt. And it's worth bearing in mind that he got, I think it was four terms of, four terms of office. So this was um, sort of post during and post-depression in the US. And he wasn't sort of driven by focus groups and fear. He was driven by vision and courage. And I think there's, there's something in that. I mean, obviously that was, it was done for the time and we, we need a new vision today. But nevertheless, I think this idea of standing up and talking about a progressive vision for the future is what we're really lacking so far. But I also think it's worth recognizing that, that leader, such leadership is as important bottom up as it is top down. We're not waiting for some great and good benevolent leader. You know, leadership occurs at home as much as it does within our, within our governments. And they're not independent. Um, but they're inexorably linked. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a sort of messy emergent linkage between us as citizens and, and, and our leaders um, and ideas percolate up and down that sort, of, that sort of messy emergent sort of chain, if you like. And that means that we all have agency for catalyzing change in probably 
I'm talking here um, to a group that is fully aware of that, that we all have the potential to help catalyze change. So um, on that note, thanks very much for listening. I'll stop Thank sharing. you. Thank you, Kevin, for this uh, tour de force. A really fantastic uh, talk. It's, uh, you know, sometimes you have to pinch yourself and, and draw these curves to actually realize, uh, uh, you know, remind yourself of, of the scale here and the urgency with which things need to happen. Um, I invite everybody again to use the Q&A for questions. And you can also, if you want, um, raise your hand and then we call on you. Um, we have a couple of questions here already. I think maybe uh, a couple are on, on this uh, notion of, okay, how do we actually get to the Marshall Plan, right? I mean, I think we all agree with your analysis, so I think it's very reasonable, but then the question is, okay, how do we tip the system and, you know, help stop what Fabian Scheidler calls, you know, the mega machine from, from, from killing us all? Um, now, one specific question is, you know, have any of existing political parties anywhere adopted policies that will us get will get us to a velvet rather than a violent revolution? You know, where do you see these good examples of politically organizing? Or are we, I mean, looking at the UK, like falling far short of uh, of what's necessary? Mm. Yeah, um, I don't, I think at a national level, we can't see any examples out there at the moment. That's not to say there aren't some that are slowly pointing in the right direction. You know, some people would argue there's elements of, certainly elements of what's going on in Costa Rica. The new Colombian president, be interesting how it plays out, but his, you know, he 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 ran on a ticket of no more fossil fuel development in in Colombia, and indeed the phase out of the existing system. And we need to see that put in practice. Um, but I think it'd be fair to say that governments around the world so far are not aligning their policies in anything like what's necessary for 1.5 or even two degrees centigrade. Um, that's not to say that that couldn't change very rapidly. But I think many, many of our leaders are, they've turned out the fact that they're not up to the job, they're too weak um, and are easily influenced by the fossil fuel lobbying group, which is incredibly powerful um, and it has its tendrils um, in every element of government and much of much of the civil civil service as well. So at the moment, I don't think we can look for national leadership on this. That's not to say we shouldn't keep looking for that and we shouldn't push for it harder. There are certainly policymakers across all parties, I'm sure, and across most countries, who, who are genuinely committed and understand the scale of the challenge. Um, but they're often not in the positions of leadership or huge influence. But we certainly have those in the UK across the parties, and I'm sure that's the case elsewhere. So I think it's a matter for us to, to try and engage with them, recognise them and engage with them and support them wherever we reasonably can. Um, and, you know, let's, let's generate our own hope through action rather than wait for others to... Uh, um, to make the necessary changes. Yeah, nice. Um, just uh, a lot of questions came in. If you can help me choosing them a little bit with upboarding questions you like, uh, audience, that would be really helpful. Um, I, I would, for some bizarre reason, which I can't quite understand, I've lost my mouse, so I can't actually, <laughs> I can't actually click the chat button at the moment. Um, there's, okay, one that's, that is uh, upboarded quite a bit um, is on alternative development pathways available to developing countries um, to, to allow them to reach development goals um, while fossil-based economies continue to their own eventual collapse. So I guess the question is on, uh, on what pathways do you see for developing countries escaping kind of the development trap that, you know, the US and the, the West has kind of yeah. you know, pushed on the, on the global stage? Um, I'm very reluctant as a typical old rich white person from the northern hemisphere to recommend what the southern hemisphere the global south and so forth should be doing we've been trying that for the last 200 years with a lot of uh, a lot of problems um so i i think people from the people from whatever those countries happen to be they'll understand their the challenges they face it is clear that actually now the energy from fossil fuels looks to be much more expensive if you look at it from a full sort of operate capital and operational level than, the, than that from renewables. So I think that there is real scope for countries that haven't really embedded the fossil fuel infrastructure yet to actually just leapfrog that. So I think it's much, perhaps it's an easier situation for those countries that haven't embedded that infrastructure. My recommendation would be, um, you know, if you take any notice of what we say from over here is try to avoid going down the fossil fuel uh, energy system route and go down a, a renewable alternative, but also always bear in mind issues of energy demand 
and um, we've mm. pretty much ignored that in in the, in the global north we just we just ignore demand and then we just provide more and more supply um, I think the other bigger challenges probably are for the industrializing countries, China, India, and some of the other large countries that are um, already fairly industrialized, but still have a lot of people in their societies who are very poor. Um, and, are trying, and, and, and China's been phenomenally successful in dragging people out of poverty, um, but it's done it with lots and lots of energy use and lots and lots of emissions. For those countries, I think the challenges are, are huge, but let's also be clear that if you look at things like solar development, that China has pursued that you know, more than the rest of the world put together. And I think it's doing something similar with wind now as well. So I'm reluctant to give a lot of advice to, to the global South or so-called developing countries. Yeah, I think I think that's fair enough. There's a one um, one question, it's also about a bit, um, quite a bit is on also how this Marshall Plan can be implemented to not push again some kind of uh, you know green colonialism or say okay we have renewable and we do electric vehicles all over the world extract minerals and so on mm. um, how do you how do you envision kind of the narrative or the story that needs to change here yeah this is this is a real challenge there's some really good work julian orwood and his group at cambridge have been doing some really interesting work and other colleagues in manchester actually on life cycle assessments of some of these transitions it's one of the reasons I say that we need to significantly move labor and resources from the relatively wealthy in our society to, to improve the public infrastructure, decarbonize our public infrastructure. And one of the reasons we have to do that, not only because of the labor and resources, but actually we mustn't increase our material uptake. We probably should, we should try to reduce that. I think in, this, in the medium term, short to medium term, when we're building in low carbon infrastructure, whilst we're retrofitting our houses, whilst we're putting public transport infrastructure in place, it will be quite hard to significantly reduce our material uh, um, use, but we should try to do that wherever we can. And so the bit that I think that goes alongside that is that we must ensure that the standards for extraction, wherever that may be, are incredibly high. And I don't just mean the environmental standards, I also mean the social standards for, for extracting these minerals. Um, and it's also why the demand side is absolutely key. You know, the first thing we should be looking at is reducing demand in the wealthy parts of the world. And I particularly mean there amongst the wealthy in the wealthy parts of the world. And I don't just mean billionaires, you know, people like myself. We, we always sort of think it's, it's another group out there. But, you know, people like me, as I said before, the typical professor is on £85,000 in the UK. And yet you compare that with a, a mean a household income of £37,000. So I think we really need to um, understand that group spreads quite wide in our society but it's probably no more than 20 percent or so of our, our population and that the wealth of that group some of that wealth will need to be reallocated elsewhere and that will help address some of the issues on material consumption um but as i say i think wider standards are really important there i personally think we should we should only accept materials that meet the standards that we would have in our own country mm. and that means that means we have to pay more to have those materials produced elsewhere, then so be it. We pay more for them. Yeah, yeah. I think your your your, your mentioning of demand side solutions is really critical here, and, and and can be can act like a kind of an emergency break. You know, I mean, it is really possible to solve this crisis, but we but we have to uh, hammer demand here. There's a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just that the absolutely key that demand issue, and remember that's the that's where there are these huge forces, you know, um, railed against against us opening that agenda and you know let's not pretend that includes lots of climate change analysts in there as well that we do not want to open that because it makes things very difficult for us who have done remarkably well out of the system yeah yeah there's a question that's and, and it's, it's your analysis also is maybe you can comment on this a little bit is reminds me of you know the analysis that some degrowth scholars put forward and i think there's you know planned reduction of things we don't need demand side solutions and so on. Maybe you can comment on this. And one question specifically is uh, whether a velvet revolution uh, necessarily needs kind of including, needs to abandon this economic model, you know, relying on continued growth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost infuriating. It's 2023 and we still have to bang on about this nonsense called GDP. I mean, it was never designed in the first place to do what we're using it for today. It's So it's it's been completely misused. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I almost, it almost frustrates me that we have this argument. Let's look at the things that are good in society. And if we want to measure anything, measure those. Let's not try and get some economists to, to take the rich, heterogeneous society we live in and break it down into one single homogeneous unit called pounds, yen, dollars, euros, whatever. You know, 
if we're going to improve site, let's improve, you know, make improve job security. Let's improve river quality. Let's improve around the world um, access to education for women. Now, improve those things, regardless of what they do for the this measure of GDP. I mean, it's just a meaningless measure, and the sooner we move away from it, the better. Um, so I know that does, to some extent, play into some of the language of the degrowth community, who have a much more sophisticated view than the language of the simple word degrowth. I think. It really underplays how how well thought through their analysis typically is. I mean, I want to see increased material consumption and indeed increased emissions for some of the poorer communities around the world, including some of the wealthier countries. In this, in the short term, that's a good thing. I want to see. So that's a growth in material consumption and energy use by them, but that needs to be compensated at the aggregate level by reductions by people like me. And yeah. so that that idea of some sort of generic growth that across all countries or and or across the globe and um, not breaking things down between different socioeconomic groups is incredibly unhelpful. But again, it's deliberately used as a way to stop us opening up the debate, because that's what we mustn't do. If you open up the debate, you start to ask the very difficult questions and look at some very uncomfortable things that have been happening. Um, and those of us that have done well out of the system do not want that to happen. So I'm all for a lot of the, you know, whether it's, you know, the, well, the, the full panoply of people working on degrowth. I think they're really doing some really important work. I just wish that their narrative would be seen to be much more sophisticated. Well, it is more sophisticated. So we actually got to see that rather than just this headline idea of degrowth, which for a lot of people is quite off-putting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish to mail everybody who writes an opinion piece about degrowth, you know, the book by Jason Nichol or Matthias Schmelzer and others, you know, that kind of stuff, because it is very, it's very nuanced and, and, and deep indeed. So that there's one question specifically about you know, what your advice would be to scientists and, and academics and how they can be useful in kind of choosing the Velvet Revolution um, that you laid out? I mean, I, I, I realize this is very naive. It is, I came from the oil industry, I used to design and build offshore oil platforms. So I have a reasonable history of, of an industry. I moved into university with a naive view that we are, should be indifferent to the sensibilities of our funders, of our bosses, and the rest of it. So as an academic, my take is that we do our work carefully and robustly with some degree of humility that we occasionally get things wrong. Um, and then we communicate it directly, vociferously and bluntly and politely. Um, and that's, that's the job of us as academics. My concern in the climate realm, and I can't really talk about outside that, I assume it occurs in other areas where, there, where there's sort of quite a lot of cross, political crossover is that a lot of the time academics in this area stay quite quiet or actually support the status quo. And both of those I see as sort of insidious activist approaches. I mean, if they were standing up directly and saying things, then you could see them as activists. But by sort of supporting the status quo, either through their silence or just manipulating their assumptions to give results that, that, that fit nicely with business as usual, and then you know, down the pub when we're talking about it, they'll talk about these things quite differently. I think that is... That is being an activist, an underhand activist. And so my job, my view is that for academics, when just wearing the academic hat is stick to our analysis and communicate it clearly and bluntly. That means not, you know, not just publishing in papers that disappear into dusty journals, but actually writing blogs, which does not bet, and it's not about dumbing down, it's about finding a language that communicates our analysis to other people. Now, as citizens, we can have other concerns, and that's right. We, as citizens, we should rightly be allowed to have those other concerns. And that's a very hard line to tread. There's a gray area between us as citizens and us as academics. But I think we should try to be very careful to make sure that people, uh, other people understand which hat we've got when we're speaking to them. It's very easy to misuse our expertise, I think, um, and, uh, you know, and be talking as a citizen about what our political desires may be and misusing our science to make out that that's some sort of objective assessment that we've made. Hmm. So yeah. candor and integrity. Um, candor, integrity, and humility, I think, are key criteria for academics, and probably a relatively thick skin and to be indifferent to our funders. Yeah. There's, um, there's one um, question here that's most uploaded about sabotage. Before we get to that, uh, maybe I can quickly... Uh, um, uh, um, preamble that with in general, your, 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 you know, what's your theory of change? And like, who do you think is really, you know, the, I don't know, the core three sectors where you where you see that things will uh, you know, be pushed yeah. forward? And... Well, let's be clear, 
you know, I, I have no more expertise than anyone else walking past outside here as to as the theories of change. I'm also I'm not absolutely certain, given the rates of change that we need to, to see if we deliver on our commitments, if there is any real expertise out there, because we haven't really had to do this before. I mean, there are there lots of parallels, or not parallels, there were lots of analogues, but they always collapse very quickly. So, you know, the ozone layer doesn't really work. Um, the Marshall Plan works to a degree. You know, um, the abol abolition of slavery, the, the suffragette movement, there are these examples throughout history, technical ones and social ones. Um, but like all analogies, they always collapse quite quickly. So, you know, given where we are today, you know, I'm, my contribution to the process of change is, is as an academic, which is, I think, is to do what I'm doing now, which is to be honest about what the conclusions point to of, of, of colleagues and my work. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to go much further in what I think is the, the theory of change. Um, I have a naive view probably that, that going back to those two words before, sort of on, well, honesty, integrity, and candor uh, in the medium term play out. I don't like the idea of people playing games, sec trying to second guess what's the best way to bring about a change. I'd rather just be a much more upfront and direct. Uh, I, I see a lot of that sort of Machiavellian um, sort of game playing going on in the climate realm within some NGOs, within the academic community, within the political realm. And I think it's incredibly unhelpful. I think if we were just more honest and direct, then we'd, you know, and, and try to be polite and courteous, but we all fail. I fail quite a lot on that. Um, then I think it would help us find the right ways forward. Um, but, you know, I don't think that simply uh, certainly PowerPoint presentations and sort of neat academic debates are going to deliver the change but it is it is an important part of the process but I, I don't overplay the sort of things that people like me do I mean we're just we're at the periphery really just trying to inform the debate hmm. it's not a very good answer to your question because I, I'm very reluctant to give a clear view as to what the process of change should be given I don't think we've ever been in this situation before yeah yeah so then do you want to take the question on sabotage? Well, so what's that? <laughs> uh, is, uh, you know, as time runs out and frustration increases, violent direct action is likely to increase in scope and intensity. What is your perspective on taking on the dominant regime in an attempt to raise the cost of fossil fuels in that way, including when is sabotage acceptable? Well, from my academic work, I can't give you a view one way or another on that. As a citizen, I do, I do a, lot of, a lot of court cases. In fact, I can't do another one later on today, when I'm trying to, I try and provide evidence, I don't, I don't support or take any, from an academic point of view, take any view as to, as to the cases I'm looking at. But what I do is provide evidence on climate change. And I have been asked a number of occasions by, um, by barristers or occasionally by judges as to whether I support the action. And the action normally, sometimes this it, is a development issue, but other times it's action where people have, have done some damage to some equipment or blockaded something, or whatever it might be. My take on that is, that's up to others to judge. But in making the judgment, I think we have, to, we have to stand back and put things in context. There isn't a non, if you like, going back to what I was saying earlier, there's not a no sabotage route. Business as usual is sabotaging the lives and livelihoods of people around the world today. And so when someone carries out some action against, against um, you know, material objects, not against other people, then I think the, the judgment we have to make is, does that damage, is it justified by the reduction in damage that we expect to occur elsewhere by carrying out that action? There is, we have just left it so long, there, this idea that somehow there's some sort of neutral position. There is no neutral position anymore. That's gone. That went a long time ago because we chose to do nothing about climate change. Mm. So if some sabotage can actually slow down the development of a fossil fuel facility, the question we have to ask is, is that slowing it down, helping overall reduce the total amount of damage because it means we're not going to cause as much problems elsewhere in the world from the impacts of climate change? And I don't think we think about this enough, that the impacts of climate change are not for tomorrow. They're a climate reality today. People are suffering. Uh, livelihoods are being pulled apart and some lives are being lost today because of emissions that we knowingly chose to put into the atmosphere. There are people a long way from here, typically, not always, but typically a long way from the wealthy countries that are causing the emissions, 
they're typically uh, poor people without a lot of global influence. Um, they're most commonly people of color and initially it affects women and children. So almost the most vulnerable groups with least inf direct influence are, are having their lives pulled apart by our emissions. And that should almost be at the forefront. That should be at the forefront of all of our thinking about climate change, whether that's about the analysis that we do or whether that's indeed about the actions we might take one way or another. So I think we need to be informed by reminding ourselves this is not a problem for tomorrow. It's a problem people are living and dying with today, and it is only set to get worse. So it's not a clear answer to whether I agree with the sabotage or not. It's saying it's again, it's a it's a judgment call that we as citizens have to make. And indeed, then society as a whole has to make some judgment call as to what action it takes to either support or stop that sort of sabotage. Yeah. And Maybe this is nothing new. I should say this is nothing new. Um, I can remember years ago in the days of Alan Clark and so forth, some, some older people might remember this, when people um, broke, broke up, broke into a, a, a place that was storing the, uh, the Nats, which is a, a small fighter aircraft, and, and, and broke them up. Those fighter aircraft were being sold, I think it was to the Suharto regime in Indonesia at the time, um, you know, to, to, to attack people in East Timor. Mm. So um, you know, this sort of activity that we're talking about in climate change is something that has a long history. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, I, I am somewhat conscious of your time, but if you have a couple more minutes, we still have. Yeah, uh, yeah that's fine. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Possible. So there's, there's, um, I think there's one thing I want to raise a little bit of a pushback um, um, here from Sud Capsic, who, who notes that uh, you seem to have argued that it's desirable to separate who we are as scientists and as citizens, uh, and not somehow the former can be, you know, purely objective. Um, but really, I think this is impossible, Stuart says. In fact, as you just said, there is no neutral position. And throughout the talk, uh, you've woven science and values together. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more about this separation? And, and Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't really disagree with that. Um, it's an impossible task to draw that, to, to walk along that line, to draw that distinction. Nevertheless, I think it's important we try because the process of trying stop, makes us stop and reflect and put things in context. And often that's what's most important is to stop and reflect. I mean, clearly not, clearly the work we do in, you know, the, the most objective form of science we could imagine isn't objective. It's colored by all sorts of things that, that you know, our, our histories, uh, access to finance and resources, our um, education that we were fortunate or otherwise to have. So you know, not, in a sense, nothing from that point is neutral. But that doesn't mean that we should just conflate everything either. I think we should try to step back and contextualize what it is that we do. And my concern a lot of the time is that we have an expertise in an area and then we use that hat when we move to another area. And I see that repeatedly. And, I, and I'm really concerned when I have lots of climate change colleagues that I've known over lots of years who will engage with the status quo and will say things that are very much driven by their view about how change occurs. So they will significantly underplay what their analysis is showing because they think that will deliver greater levels of change. And I think that has been incredibly undermining to the mitigation debate. I'm not talking about the science here. Uh, other people can talk about that. I'm talking about the mitigation, the reducing emissions, that debate. I think that debate has been severely constrained by, by well-meaning academics who have deliberately misused their expertise to try and push as hard as they think the system can be pushed. And that is not our job as academics. In fact, I mean, and particularly now, as I think the system, you know, the system as we have at the moment cannot address the scale of challenge that we, that we need. That's why I think it has to be, we have to go beyond that the current sort of norms of our system, the boundaries of our current system, you know, it, it's, it's failed. And it's failed because we have tried to play the game within it too easily. Mm. And so I, I have some agreement with, I, I can't remember the person who said it, but their, with, with their point. But nevertheless, I think to stop and reflect and contextualize our position and repeatedly do that is really important. I don't mean to do it once every six months. I mean to almost on a, almost a daily, if not a weekly basis, to stop and reflect how much of our views come from our analysis and how much of it come from other, other sort of worldviews that we might have. And it's not an easy thing to separate. In fact, it's impossible to separate, but I think the trying is important. Yeah. Maybe, I can, maybe I can talk on to there because it seems some of your, uh, some of your very valid uh, hesitation or, or, or like um, 
how to put it is kind of in the kind of Naomi Oreskes, Eric Conway style, where you know we've we've seen how scientists you know using their position to influence policy debates have like greatly derailed progress on tobacco and climate change. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, she, she has a great paper, 2020. The social, what's the social responsibility of climate scientists? Saying they're really well, they have an obligation to you know be sentinels in society. They know special knowledge that they should convey, but then be very careful when they move out of their expertise and you know opine on you know policies and changes that they're not experts in. I think this is a little bit also your view. But then on the other hand, we have people like James Hansen or Peter Kalmos, or also many academics in scientist rebellion who say, look, actually. Uh, as you say, this information deficit, uh, it's its not an information deficit with the policymakers, right? It's really like uh, power entrenching itself mm. and, and blocking, blocking progress and civil disobedience as a scientist, as a kind of a move to, to help uh, push for change. I'm curious what, what your view is on, on that. I don't think that really, it's very different from what I was just saying. Um, yeah. I mean, if we look at what exactly. Peter Calvis and... Hansen doing, and all credit to them for doing what they're doing. What they've done is they've taken their analysis and they're using that to inform their views as a citizen in society and what they should do. And then they choose to do certain things that other citizens may choose not to do. But that that those decisions as, uh, as, you know, as citizens is informed by their expert analysis. That's perfectly reasonable. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, and I think in, in lots of times, I have a huge amount of credit, respect for the courage that some of these people are showing. And, you know, history is littered with people who have done this. And so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to what they're doing. I don't think it's misinformed. I don't, I, I personally don't think they've also, you know, by and large, I think they've, they've stuck by their science and then they've used their science to inform their citizenry views. That's, that's what we should do. But I don't think then that we have we have to be then careful of saying, well, I, I, I've got a view of change of how that definitely should work. I mean, that isn't our expertise unless it is, which it, for most of us it isn't. <laughs> then we sh we shouldn't pretend that we know those things. And um, so I have a lot of respect for that for you know for that move, taking our expert realm and expertise and applying that to our citizenry concerns. That's that's a good thing. And in fact, I I, I would rather we did that more often in our society. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, I mean, that's the point about scientists' rebellion to a de to a significant degree. I mean, I, um, it, it's people who understand the scale of the challenge through their analysis and say, "I can't sit back quietly and just do the analysis and just I, you know, I need to do something else to bring about the change that my analysis tells me as a citizen is really important." And so you, it's a judgment call, and I think that's a, a valid judgment to make. And you can probably tell from from the sort of my presentation and my tone in what I'm saying here that I'm very supportive and quite understand those those views. And, yeah. I, and I'm thankful, I go further, I'd say I'm thankful that people step outside of the norms of our society to try and drive change. Protest is as a very long and honorable tradition and without it, we'd be in a dire situation. So and, you know, I, don't to, you know, I don't have to go to the, the, the list of things about history that have, you know, it's, it's Protest has often been behind major improved social change. Yeah. And complacency has often been behind um, the continuation of really terrible things that have happened. Yeah. Yeah. There was, um, maybe I take this to remind our, our listeners that, uh, you know, we have big set of actions coming up in May mm. 7th to the 13th. And if you're interested, um, please um, uh, check in the chat and, and get involved. Um, now, Maybe there are a couple of other questions that, that we can still take, Kevin, if you have time. Um, one, one is saying that I'm pessimistic about a turnaround in the current political motivation for Velvet Revolution. And I think you share some of that pessimism. Yeah. Uh, I am preparing mentally for a violent revolution, something that I find difficult when I look at the lives of my currently small children. Could I ask you to speculate about how a violent revolution is likely to play out? Oof. I think it's probably already playing out in some poor parts of the world um, with just the warming we've seen so far, you know, 1.1, 1.2 degrees centigrade. Firstly, any, maybe this is wrong to say this, but I think any sort of right thinking person can be, can be anything other than pessimistic about the situation we're in. But that's very different from saying it's hopeless. You know, there is there is plenty of action that we can take, which is exactly why we're engaging today, because 
we can see that there are ways for, we're not exactly sure what they are, but we can see that there are ways forward to a much more progressive future. You know, time is not on our, on our side particularly, but we're not guaranteed to fail only if we don't try. You know, if we try, then there's a chance of success. And that's where hope emerges from trying, from, and from action. Nevertheless, I think it's perfectly wise to think, well, what happens if we, we do, it, do our best and we do fundamentally fail? How do we prepare for a violent future? And I have no simple answer to that other than probably something which is just very human to me, and I don't know whether it's true for other people, is to try to use as much compassion as possible. Mm. Um, and not just to people around us, to, to, to more glo you know, to globally as well. Because it won't play out as a, as a, as a single event. We, we saw what happened in continental Europe when um, a war in Syria saw really what was just little more than a handful of refugees entered one of the most sophisticated political unions in the world, the European Union. You know, remember that most of the, by far and away, the majority of refugees went to Jordan and Lebanon, countries that could barely afford them. A few meandered into the incredibly rich part of the world called the European Union. And what was our first response? Razor wire. Well, close the barriers. You know, it was, and the UK was atrocious in this as well. And so were some other countries, Hungary and so forth. And at least Germany and Sweden made some attempt, at least initially, to, to open the doors. But I think it demonstrated how and I'm not saying that's not a climate change event. It may have had a small, small climate signal, but it wasn't a climate change event. Um, but it demonstrates how, well, we think a re relatively robust union like the EU, under pressure of a bit of migration of people who are slightly culturally different, you know, caused ructions. And it still, still has a legacy of some of the right wing um, sort of dog whistle response that we've had. To, to, to immigration. And again, it's evident in this country that that's, that that's occurring. And so we don't seem at the moment to me to have the mechanisms by which we were able to deal with the implications, the violent implications, not the institutional mechanisms of significant levels of climate change. If that plays out in terms of migration, um, access to food, access to energy, to warmth, to mobility, um, you know, we have every reason to try to make sure we avoid that situation. I think we need to try to think about what happens if we do end up in that position. And I think probably, and it sounds naive and trite, but perhaps compassion and understanding are important, important emotional elements to develop in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that collectively as a society, we've not been particularly good at that. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's been fostered by by a certain political mindset as well, that has been incredibly unhelpful and made us, we, we, we're very much a sort of an other world. We point to others out there. It's always the other's fault. We're very reluctant ever to hold the mirror up to ourselves and yeah. see ourselves in other people's dilemmas. And I think we need to probably spend more time doing that. I don't think that can be helped by academics doing PowerPoint presentations. I think we need a, you know, a much more sort of wider debate about these sets of issues. Yeah. by and large i think we need to play to the positive parts of us as humans and i think we can do that i think i, I mean most people i meet are, seem to me to be very good people even people i you know, i strongly disagree with most people are genuinely good people how is it we tap into that part of our character rather than the sort of more competitive aggressive blame other type part of our character which unfortunately at the moment i think much of our politics um you know, fosters that sort of part of our of our of our character yeah yeah, that's beautifully said. It, it ties into a question that was also uh, uh, asked about, you know, this process of othering, actually, that that a, a violent revolution is actually not the worst case scenario. You know, the worst case is like really, a, I'm quoting here, a bluntly targeted and productive genocide affecting the world's poorest and most vulnerable abortion non-white people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a the question is, why is this this genocidal or racial angle of the issue not not yet being recognized for the scandal that it actually is? I don't know why it's not being recognized, but I think it's completely right to say that it is there. Uh, yeah. We need to, they're very uncomfortable terms to use for us, particularly usually rich white academics. It makes us squirm in our seat when we talk about things like race, diversity, gender, these sorts of issues that we're not comfortable with them. And and when we're not comfortable with them. We, we, stem, we step away from them when we should be trying to address them. 
we should be trying to understand those sets of issues, trying to empathize with them the best way that we can. And that's going to mean some big changes for how we how we think about the world. But we need to bring those issues in. Um, th I mean, there are some, there's some very good work being done in, the, in these in these areas. I think we do need to em engage to welcome in, but also for us to to go and and be listeners in other parts of the world, you know, ideally virtually or slowly from a missions point of view. Um, I think there's still a deep arrogance of the global north overseeing the global south. And I think that's embedded in our integrated assessment models. Why is it that all of our model scenarios assume this ongoing levels of inequality? They mm -hmm. do that because they assume ongoing growth and wealth inequality in the global north. And why is that? Because the modelers themselves, the people heading the modeling groups, are in that incredibly privileged position in the global north. And this is very uncomfortable opening up this debate. So that's why I said the, the work of Kanitko and others, I think, is really important here to start to unpick this agenda. Um, and I think it's important it's unpicked by people in the global south pointing it out to us. Um, but the more we can open our, our, our doors to their views, and the more that we are prepared to sit down and listen to their take on issues, uh, you know, I think that we might develop the necessary humility to start to address some of these issues. I was at Glasgow COP um, a couple of years ago, and I talked about climate change there, and two two women on one of the panels pulled me up quite rightly because I was using the language of threat around climate change. And it just made me think, you know, I'd, you know I'd, I'd fallen into that typical wealthy Western view of climate change as a threat that lots of us as academics have, and they said it's a reality in their world, daily reality. And it made me stop and think, oh, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I'd like to think I've got some sort of handle on this issue, but I was so far out from the reality of the situation for many people around the globe today. So I think we have to have that, that humility to realize that we've got a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's some more stuff. I mean, again, I don't want to uh, encroach too much on, on your time. I mean, it's something that just let me know when you uh, when you have other things to do. Like well, one... let's, let's, let's make it till half past. So another. OK, nice. Then we'll fix the climate by half past. <laughs> one thing that, that comes up repeatedly a little bit and it touches on what you said now is, you know, the the, the difficulty uh, talking about race, genocide, um, but also you know, realizing on some level our own complicity, right? And there's this repression. Tatja Müller, one of the co-founders of Endige Länder, says like there's this Verdrängungsgesellschaft, there is re society of repression, where actually uh, um, many people are, are just, uh, you know, become polarized or the right is kind of, uh, you know, um, getting stronger and stronger. We've increased polarization. We have like climate action groups being just hated, basically, by virtually all of society. I'm curious how, how do you see because you know for the for the velvet revolution uh we we need a a broad-based coalition to actually say okay we we want this right so how do we avoid you know the right and conservatives you know colonizing i mean they've already done this to a large extent mm. the, the debate and kind of blocking progressive policies yeah well it's a step in alongside it's, it's an interest i have but it's well outside my expertise here um, yeah. And so other people can completely say, you know, well, I might be I'm talking rubbish for experts in this field. My take on this is that we are in the position we're in today and we have to stop sometimes stop and reflect, look at our histories and our geographies and so forth. And why, why is this we in this position today where it looks like, at least from a first sort of glance, it looks like the, the, the right wing has been incredibly successful in, in creating this antagonism towards you know, whatever it is to be, you know, in this case, climate activists, but also towards lots of other elements in our society. And I don't blame the right for that. I blame the left as someone who sees myself leaning quite a long way politically on the left. I don't, you know, we have not cared about the dust belt people in the US. We haven't cared about the industrial communities in the UK that have been fractured and lost their jobs. We haven't cared about those across continental Europe. Um, you know, we look under the Blair years in the UK, so-called Labour government, where inequality increased. You know, really keen on, uh, you know, on the sort of elite end of culture, but not at all interested in in manufacturing and and um, and the communities that have relied on those sorts of industries. And eventually, after decade after decade, it's just the same in the states. The Democrats showed no concern for these communities. After decade after decade, no longer do the people in those communities trust the progressive left well that's not the fault of the right that's the fault of we sold them out we did not care about them 
And now when those people stand up and try to be counted in whatever way that might be, voting for idiots like Johnson or for Trump, we, we, we call it populism and we blame them. Well, no, let's turn around and blame ourselves for not providing a progressive vision for those communities. And I think that plays out again, exactly as you're saying today, with reason we're seeing this antagonism towards groups like perhaps some of the climate activists and so forth, is because we're still seen as a part of that sort of elite, so-called progressive left that has not cared about their communities. So let's start to rephrase some of our thinking around what is what is positive for those communities. I mean, these are communities often that do not, they, you know, these people who you, you're saying are, are problematic, they often are not high emitters. Yeah. They're people that, are, that, that do not consume a lot. They're locked into the structural, often the crumbling structural um, uh, infrastructure of our society. And they've been played by wealthy journalists who own the papers, um, by the political right, and they've been left in the lurch by the political left and the progressive left. So I think we just need to be honest with those communities and talk about what would be positive, which is what I'm trying to show here. I think there are lots of very positive things for those communities that can come out and respond to climate change, regardless of the emissions. I think you know, building a progressive low carbon society is a much more positive future for them, yeah. you know, regardless of the carbon benefit, than the the agenda that's been given them, the competitive nonsense that's been given them by the right. But the left hasn't stood back and, and developed that. The left has just moved further and further and further right. So we, we no longer have progressive visions in somewhere like the UK. That Well, we don't have them in the mainstream political parties. And you look at the yellow vests in, in France, the amount of times that's talked about, oh, well, that showed that they weren't interested in climate change. That, you know, that's not true at all. That is a much more based, you know, there were mu there's much, much more in that antagonism within the yellow vests in France than was seen in that, that sort of frontline bit about, about fuel protests and so forth. So yeah. I think that we need to stop and reflect and again, point the mirror back at ourselves and not try and blame others. Don't blame the right. Don't blame the, the journalists. You know, look at ourselves and say, well, why, why have we let these other people down? And how do we create a narrative that brings them on board? How do we get them on board to help us to construct that narrative? Um, you know, more humility, more openness. Difficult, really difficult to do. I mean, I'm not saying any of this is easy. Um, and, and I think as academic communities, we broadly fail in this as well. We feed into a particular sort of elite view of society, which I think has, um, again, has, has underplayed the value of these other communities that I think you're talking about here, sort of dust belt, industrial belt type communities. But this is my, this is my take completely as a citizen, genuinely interested in these issues and try to develop my views, but <laughs> my academic work doesn't really inform this very much we'll be careful not to quote you as uh, professor karen anderson uh, the scientist <laughs> yeah no that makes a lot of sense and it's, it's interesting i've been reading you know the big myth by naomi oreskes and eric conway on kind of the yeah. history and it's just incredible the amount of propaganda that capital and so on put put into changing how we view you know ourselves in the world um there is and there's one question asking whether you consider running for parliament. Uh, I guess it's more of a compliment. <laughs> well, than... I, did, I did consider it a long time ago, but... Um, uh, the time scales. Yeah, yeah the time scales. It was, it was a long time ago now. And um, yeah. For Maybe reasons I didn't go ahead with it. Yeah. The, the, uh, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm interested because you mentioned also you worked, I think, for a decade or so in the petrochemical industry. And can you maybe just sketch a little bit, uh, yeah, your own journey in the climate space and, you know, how you've seen it unfold also because you're really like a staunch critic of the of the you know the, the status quo the ipcc mitigation modeling community and i'm mm. curious how it evolved um also yeah. from the past and industry yeah i won't go to full history of my background but yeah, yeah. i mean I, I left school at 16 and, and worked on in the engine rooms of ships for quite a few years and then went to university later on um and then went to work in the oil industry and I, I, right from a good child i had an environmental interest whatever you would call that it wasn't called climate change then i was interested in nature and i didn't see and i was always interested in engineering my dad worked as a as a fitter um as a mechanic if you like at a nuclear power station in sizewell um the old nuclear station and lived in the countryside and i saw no conflict between working in engineering and being deeply interested in the environment and i i held that view when i was working on ships and indeed when i was, when I was working on the oil platforms i mean I, I i did my job in the oil platforms but i also was heavily involved in trying to stop the use of CFCs 
um, and trying to be, find ways to stop the oil companies continuing to pollute the, but to, to have spills into the oceans where, where we were operating, which they did almost on a daily basis, um, operational spills. Um, so I was interested in those sets of issues as well. So there was never any great revelation. I didn't wake up one day, flash a light, and you know, it was it was just a, an evolution. And climate change became a big issue in the nineteen late nineteen eighties and early nineteen nineties. And I went back to university, and um, other than a short spell back in the oil and gas industry for a year to get some extra funding to extend my PhD, um, I've stayed in university ever since, um, working on these these sets of issues. Um, I think having an engineering background and being genuinely really interested in engineering and miss it a lot actually. <laughs> Uh, I think it helps me see through the nonsense that is in a lot of the models where they mm. sort of press a button mm. and, a, and a fledgling idea from an academic pings into a global industry overnight without any technical issues. And that's just not how that's just not how engineering works. Um, and so I'm very critical of the, the sort of the way that engineering is embedded in the models and it's used, misused um, to avoid having to embed social changes and so forth and I, I don't think the ipcc is improving on this i think the working group three there's some really good people in working group three and some of the elections are going on now for the new heads of groups and so forth and i'm really concerned that the integrated assessment modeling group will get its get even further entrenched into the ipcc there are good people trying to push a different agenda but they're sort of at the moment they're just being let in to legitimize the integrated assessment modelers so i think we're, we're at the moment we're in a, a real risk of of locking in the integrated assessment modeling community and their domination of the agenda for another whole round of the IPCC. Mm. I hope that doesn't happen. There are some good people there, but they're in the minority. Um, and you know, the, the integrated assessment modeling group, who I hold significantly responsible for a lot of our failing on mitigation, um, they're more dominant now than they were before. And to some extent, by allowing other voices in there, they almost give the impression that they've opened up. I don't think they have. I think they've closed down um, even further by, by make, giving the impression of opening up the debate more widely. So the whole chapter on demand in, the, in AR6 is yeah. it's just a, a false hope, you would say? or oh, You said it. The whole chapter. Imagine the whole chapter on demand. Right, right. Amazing. Amazing. Let's allow that in there. How much of that is in the science and the summary for policymakers? Hardly anything. You know, they're allowed to mention the word sufficiency, and I understand that was a bit of a battle to get that in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the internal workings of the IPCC, which I, I won't say too much about, but I get to, I get a very good account of what happens internally. I deliberately have always stayed outside it. I'm very much in favour of the IPCC, particularly working group one and two. I don't particularly think working group three should be there, but not because of what it does, but because the old framing of mitigation is, I think, is is um, is too political and cannot be optimised in any way to provide a sort of generic output that I find working group three produces. So my personal view is we shouldn't have working group three, regardless of whether it agrees with my views or not um, in the IPCC. But whilst whilst it's there, I think if we are going to have it, I think it needs to be much more open with a much wider array of scenarios and I don't think just allowing a few people to come in to have a chapter on demand and mention sufficiency occasionally is sufficient I mean you know that tells me a lot about how dominant the integrated assessment modeling community are yeah and that basically by that I mean you know status quo economics yeah it's it's, you know, it's broadly you know general equilibrium economics it's all the things that you talked about before you know ongoing GDP growth and all of those wonderful things, all and all problems solved by some bit of shiny mechanical engineering kit. Yeah. Yeah, Not has recently published a paper again on optimal warming. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a long way to go. Yes, yeah, yeah. Optimal, but, optimal Kevin, levels of cancer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. This was, uh, this was really incredible. Thank you for your time. No, no problem at all. Uh, and um, thanks, everybody, for uh, for tuning in. Um, again, we have big actions coming up in May. Um, find us and um, get involved and help secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And, and I'll just say thanks. As someone who does not, has not been out there and glued myself to anything or got involved in any other action like this, um, I'd like to pay genuine respect and thanks to all those people who are prepared to, to do things that many of us aren't prepared to do. So, um, yeah it's not you, you you're not alone there are lots of other people out there looking on who think thank heavens these people have the courage to go out and do what they're doing <laughs>